Hello there, Evie here. Welcome to... The Aerocool QS240. So before we jump into the main part of the video, which is a lot of camera work and narration, let's go over the, some of the basics. So essentially we're looking at a budget Micro ATX case, uh, the budget part being around £30 here in the UK. Uh, if it's available in the US and the EU, I will check that for you and let you know here. Uh, it will be probably be around the $35 to $40 and €35 Euro mark in your respective regions. Elsewhere I'm not entirely sure. but you get the gist. If it's available to you, it's going to be a budget case. But is it worth having? Well, that's up to you really, uh, based on what you need and that sort of stuff. And we will cover all of this uh, GPU sizes. Uh, it'll actually fit any GPU you like, so we'll skip past that. Uh, but fans, uh, hard disk drive placements, and that sort of thing. So anyway, without any further ado, let's jump straight into the video, or into the main part of the video. Uh, uh, the lighting, by the way, I haven't mentioned in the video. It's cable mod lighting strips. They're quite expensive for what they are, really. Uh, so any lighting strip will do, but... I think it looks fantastic once you've put in some lighting strips. So some RGB LEDs, preferably magnetic ones, uh, will be extremely usable uh, in, in this case. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump straight into the video. Thank you very much for checking this one out. And if you want to see more like it, feel free to subscribe and like the video if you did like it. Of course, dislike if you don't. Uh, but always let me know what your thoughts are about the video in the comments and I'll always check them out. I generally chat to everybody who uh, who makes a comment. Uh, and if you have any questions, of course, in the comments below and I'll do my best to help you out. Thanks for checking out the video and I hope you enjoy it. See you at the end for a wrap up and during for some commentary. So the Aerocool QS240, here we go. In terms of packaging, we're looking at a very standard setup of a cardboard box, a couple of expanded polystyrene bookends and a plastic bag. It's tried and tested, so no real complaints here. Taking a look at the outside of the case, let's run over a few of the major details. Of course this case has a side panel window, and to address a comment from a while back, this is the reason that I generally don't include audio from peeling the film from a plastic side panel window. Yeah, not so smooth or sensual. Peeling the film from a window only works well for glass windows. So looking at the rest of the case, you can notice a slight mismatch in colours between the steel and plastic panels, the steel panels being a little lighter. This is exacerbated by the lighting for recording, but is still kind of noticeable with more natural lighting. There is clearly a very particular style to this case, and one that I'm quite fond of, but it does fall short in a few areas, such as the style of the feet that introduce sharp angles unlike the curved edges of the front and top. Not a big criticism by the way, but I'm just purely pointing out a few opinions that could be improved in future revisions. But the main feature of this case is of course the continuous vent wrapped up and over the case. Apart from the small Aerocool logo at the bottom, it's an unbroken design that is enclosed by two protruding square sections of trim. This design flows up and over the top of the case with a rather pleasing curve. Of course that depends on your taste, but what doesn't depend on your taste is the top I.O. that you get with this case, which consists of a single USB 3.0 port, two USB 2.0 ports, separate microphone and headphone jacks, a reset button, drive activity LED and power activity LED, and of course a power button. All of which is positioned at the front of the case, and following the vent towards the back, let's see where this thing ends. Here at the back of the top panel, the vent terminates after another curve, which creates a very seamless look when you look at the case from the front. We'll see more of this later. Moving on to the actual back of the case, we can see the motherboard rear I.O. position and 120mm fan position up top. Just below these we can find the PCI Express slot covers, but no ventilation overflow section adjacent. And in this classic layout, the power supply unit position is right at the bottom. So as these videos tend to go, let's tear down the case and have a look at the chassis beneath. Two thumb screws later and the offside panel can be removed. Due to the large central bulge, the panel is very sturdy and allows for much more cable management space. More on that later. Same again here, two thumb screws later and the windowed side panel is off. And again, that bulge makes this panel nice and sturdy and allows for a much larger CPU cooler, but there's a bit more to be said about that later. 
Since the top panel contains the front I.O., the wires need to be unstrapped from the chassis. It's not an important detail, but in like in any case built this way, you could cause a bit of damage if you try to yank the top off without untying it all first. But before the top can be taken out, the front needs removing first. You can, in theory, just pull the front off, and with enough force it will come flying off, but that's not very dignified and it's a little unpredictable. Plus, getting purchased to the sides is a little tricky. So I'd recommend pinching the clips on the inside that are only accessible on one side, then giving it a gentle pull and the other side will come away very easily. Same for the top. Pinching the clips on the inside allows the top to come away very easily. Again, you can just pull the panel off, but this way is much more reliable, and I at least recommend pinching the clips on one side to gain access to the top of the chassis. So let's take a further look at the two panels. The front panel contains a foam filter, which is typical for a budget case, but the filter isn't removable unless you want to unbend the metal tabs of the front vent, which will likely end up breaking off eventually. So to clean this out, you'll want to vacuum the front of the panel, which is basically what solves the problem. The top is essentially the same as the front panel, but of course it contains the front IO PCB, which has all these lovely coloured cables attached to it. Ideally, we'd prefer a black PCB and black cables to boot, but that's not really what you get with budget cases. So if you want to improve this, you can get some black cable sleeving, but don't worry about the PCB, you won't really see this from the inside of the case. As for the front of the chassis, you can fit two 120mm fans with an accompanying 240mm radiator. Pay close attention to the screw slots which are protruding towards the front. This means that if you attach the fans to the outside of the chassis, the blades won't clip the front panel. Whereas if you want to install the fans on the inside of the chassis, then you'll need to get quite a few washers to create a 1mm or so offset from the panel just to make sure you don't destroy a fan blade. Speaking from experience, this happens all too easily. If you're wondering what the manual has to say on this, it's very wishy-washy on fan and radiator placement, so just use common sense. As for the top, there really isn't enough room for a fan to fit above the chassis, so fans below the chassis only here. And you'd be hard pressed to fit a radiator in the top as well as fans due to the clashes with motherboard components such as the VRM heatsinks. To the rear we have an included rear fan that spins up to 1200 RPM. It's a cheap sleeve bearing fan but it'll do the trick to get you started, and if you really wanted to expand a water cooling loop, you could always place a 120mm radiator back here. Below the fan are punch out PCI Express slot covers which are the cheapest and lowest quality option and are awful, more on those later. Right at the bottom we have the power supply unit position, but just going back to the fan I'd like to mention that it's a 3 pin fan so you can control its speed with a DC fan curve rather crudely, but it also has a 4 pin Molex connector which will run it at full speed if you have no other option, although I don't really know anyone who has to resort to a 4 pin Molex fan these days. Moving back to the bottom of the chassis, we have some steel feet and a vent for the power supply unit, and towards the front we have a drive cage, which we'll look more into in a minute. But before we move on, a quick look beneath the chassis reveals two legs with four foam pads for feet, and a rather crude but effective power supply unit filter. Anyway, back to that drive cage. We have three different fixing types for three different drives across two drive types. We'll work that out in a few minutes. The motherboard tray on the other hand has a lot going for it, there are a good amount of holes for cable management, a couple of 2.5 inch drive mounting positions to the top right, and a few pre-installed standoffs. To the back of the motherboard tray we can see plenty of cable management loops which is a huge pro to this case and so many cases get that wrong, and the rest of the motherboard tray was seen a second ago. But this is where things go a little south for me at least. Check out the gap between the motherboard tray and the side of the chassis. That is unbelievably tight, and you could say that's what the bulge in the side panel is for. But the bulge in the side panel doesn't reach right to the edge of the case. More on that later. As for the included accessories with this case, let's break down what we get. From right to left we have a PCI Express slot cover and 6 zip ties. And as for the screws, we have 18 2.5 inch drive screws, 8 motherboard screws, 4 3.5 inch drive screws, 4 extra standoffs and a plastic Phillips head adapter for installing the standoffs. And of course there is a manual that really doesn't have much to say. So now we've all been introduced to the QS240, let's build a system in it. For some reason the power supply unit is always where I start, but after building in this case I've got a little foresight on how I'd build in this case now, which I'll share with you as we go along. 
It's generally always easiest to connect the cables into the power supply unit first before you place it into the case like so. It takes a little work but it's a hell of a lot easier than trying to connect all the cables post installation. And of course it's always a good idea to install the included screws to hold it in place. As for the system itself, this is our standard Micro ATX case test system which consists of an MSI Z170M mortar motherboard with an Intel i7-6700K CPU being cooled by a Cooler Master Hyper 212 EVO with two EK VADA F4240ER fans. For RAM we have 8GB of Crucial Ballistics as well as 16GB of G-Skill Ripjaws 5 and the graphics card that will be coming later will be the MSI R9390X. Now onto installing this chunk of the system into the case. As mentioned earlier, there are a few standoffs pre-installed, but you'll likely need more to add depending on your motherboard, which you can get from the accessories bag. With the main standoffs installed, now the rear IO shield can be punched into the back and the main part of the system can be lowered in. But just before we get onto that, notice how the top left standoff is right in line with the hole to the left of it. This means with a little foresight, the motherboard is going to be covering up most of that hole, making it nearly impossible to route the CPU cables through after the motherboard has been installed. Hence why we're routing the CPU power cables now before it's too late. And now we can lower the motherboard in. It is a little tight to squeeze it in since there aren't many angles in which the motherboard can be supported, so we'll have to lower it in by the cooler to get the best grip. But this is expected of a very small case, well pretty small micro ATX case. So as long as the cables are out of the way, installation is not a problem, but you can clearly see that some of the holes through the motherboard tray have been blocked up by the micro ATX board, more on that later. And of course now we need to install the standoff screws, but we can skip past that since there's plenty more to get through. Some cleaning up of the new fan cables that have been introduced into the case, as well as the existing fan cable, is always a good idea, but more importantly, you can see here how important it is to spot where you need to route cables prior to installing certain components. There's just no way that that CPU power cable head would be able to make it through the motherboard tray after its installation, but luckily we spotted that in advance, so connecting the CPU power to the motherboard is no problem. Okay, so I had to finish the build off yesterday because it got too late, so we're going back onto it today. This is slightly off topic, but really interesting. Now, I was checking the case out when I was picking it up off the floor after I packed it away yesterday, uh, last night, and I noticed that there was this loop at the front which looks suspiciously, suspiciously like a carry handle, and it does function as a carry handle. It's not sharp underneath, so you can lift it, but I was thinking, why would you need a carry handle there? Then I was thinking, maybe it's for something to go through, and that got me thinking, that looks suspiciously like a slot where a radiator would go. So I got the radiator out and had a little look. Now it actually turns out that the holes for the inputs or inlets or outlets of this radiator fit perfectly with that slot. And I'll, you'll see some footage now showing that. But unfortunately, barely any of the holes line up with the holes to screw it into the chassis, which seems really odd. So there must be some sort of combination of where these inlets and output outlets go here, or on the bottom, same situation on the bottom, only none of the screw holes line up, um, that will make this fit to the front. Now, I would be really interested in exploring this idea, and believe it or not, the front panel does fit over the top of this, so it does all work. Now, there isn't an issue with, like there is in many other cases where the front panel acts as a ventilation duct to the top or bottom of that front panel case. This is actually a situation where the, the airflow goes through that panel, so there's not an issue with putting anything in that void there. So you could put fans in the front, or you might be able to fit a radiator in the front, so bear that in mind when building your setup, but also bear in mind that you will barely be able to fit any screws into it. But there might be a radiator model out there that is more flexible than this one. So anyway, back to the video, but I thought that was interesting, so I thought I'd let you know. Now onto storage! We of course have three 2.5 inch drives which we'd normally place into micro ATX cases, but since this case offers enough storage for both these and two 3.5 inch drives on top, I thought we'd push the boat out and see if we can put in the full load. So remember I mentioned earlier about the drive types and sizes with reference to this drive cage, here's where it gets interesting. The top 3.5 inch drive slot features this really interesting sled that expands and retracts on these plastic rails. Notice the pins on either side of the sled. This means you can simply open the sled up, lower a 3.5 inch drive into it and slide it to the right so the holes interact with the pins on the sled and then once the drive is in place you can clamp the sled onto the drive. 
This is a really interesting way of designing a drive sled, and one that's new to me. So, once you've checked it's all in place, you can simply slide it back into the drive cage and that's it. Also note that if you have a 2.5 inch drive to go here instead of a 3.5 inch drive, you can do that as well. So now is where the drive cage gets a little confusing. To install the 3.5 inch drive into the lower slot you need to flip the case onto its side. Now you can install a drive without removing the legs first but I'd like to get them out of the way just so we have the clearest view possible. So a couple of screws later and the leg is removed. So about that drive, it needs to be lowered into the cage which is a little fiddly. Once it's lowered in, you'll need to give it a little guidance so that the drive screw holes line up with the cage's screw holes to get that first screw in. But once you've got one screw in, you've got all the screw holes pretty much lined up. But this is such a cumbersome way of doing this compared to the other drive installation that sits right above. And I don't see why you would do this instead of the preferred option above, except for cutting costs of course. So that's that drive installed, so the leg can be replaced, but before we move on to the 2.5 inch drives, let's take a look at how it all looks post installation. I don't know about you, but those drives don't appear to line up properly. Who decided on two different drive mounting mechanisms? I don't know, anyway let's move on to the 2.5 inch drives to see if there's any more sense to be found there. So on top of the drive cage we can install one of the 2.5 inch drives into this pin and screw mount. This style of 2.5 inch drive mount is becoming increasingly more common, it's very simple to use, construct and is very secure even for hard disk drives. But due to the earlier placement of the power supply unit, access to the screws was not so simple. So if you're going to use this slot, install the power supply unit afterwards. As for the other two 2.5 inch drive slots, it's a simple case of using four screws each to connect them to the motherboard tray, and the centre hole will be used to route all of the cables through, again more on that later. As for the cable management, this was a tough one. With such a small depth between the rear motherboard tray and the side panel, all the cabling needs to be focused towards the bulge in the side panel which will be in the centre of the case. And since we're dealing with full size ATX cables in a small micro ATX case, a fair amount of the cabling needs to be curled around to reduce the excess. But the sheer amount of well placed cable management loops at least makes this somewhat simpler than it could have been otherwise. This isn't the 100% finished cable management setup, since at this point there was still the lighting strip setup to install, but I wanted to bring close attention to the amount of cabling going through the hole in the motherboard tray between the SSDs. Take note of the SATA cable going down the back of the top SSD to create a data connection between the motherboard and the bottom SSD. You might ask why not go straight through the centre hole, well when I did it caused all sorts of system instabilities due to the tight bending of the SATA cable, so I had to reroute it to flatten the cable out which seemed to solve the problem. Also pay close attention to the connections to the 3.5 inch drives at the bottom which took a lot of work to squeeze in due to the close proximity to the side panel. As for the fans, they are all linked to this small fan hub, which in turn links back to the CPU fan header which we'll use to control all the fans through the BIOS. Moving back to the main compartment, it's pretty interesting to check out the weave of power and data cables linking the opposing SSDs to their various ports. Also notice the 24 pin motherboard power connector and 5 SATA data connectors squeezing past them to the left and right. As for the excess graphics card power cables, well they used to live under the hard disk drive cage, but that turned out to be extremely problematic, so they live curled up neatly at the bottom of the case. If this isn't for you then I'd suggest checking out some cases with basement cover panels. To set this system up for the first round of thermal testing, we're going to be throwing in an EK Varda 2200 RPM fan in the front. Something I really appreciate is the central fan mounting position. It allows a single fan to provide a fair distribution of airflow to both the CPU and graphics card, but of course two is always going to be better and we'll be looking into that later. Like I mentioned earlier, due to the raised screw holes, the fans are better positioned on the outside of the chassis, which means the screws have to be applied from the inside, which you can probably tell isn't the easiest thing to do with a system fully built inside. So on your build list you first need to fit fans and then you can fit the drives and then you can fit whatever you like in afterwards, but I do appreciate that a set of fans or a radiator can fit within the front panel, so there are pros and cons here and there. This is where things go a little pear shaped and it's obvious why and there are clearly things that can be done about it. So what's the problem? Well by replacing the top panel we have to deal with all of the front IO cables. 
One day this will all be wireless, but until then, the only viable hole to route them through is towards the back of the case, and unfortunately that eats up a lot of the cable's length. So this resulted in all but the front audio cable being able to reach their respective headers on the motherboard, since the drives and cables are covering up all of the other available holes. Clearly packing this much into a case does create some limitations, more on that later. For now we can finish the top off by punching it into position and following that up with popping the front panel back in place. As for the graphics card, this cover panel needs removing before attempting to slot it into position. Once removed we can finish the preparation by bending the second PCI Express slot until it snaps off. This has got to be one of the greatest downfalls of the case and it's a clear sign of a budget case. It's not too bad, but it would have added a lot to make these replaceable slot cover panels rather than snap off panels. The rest of the case seems pretty robust, and in my opinion, this just brings it down a notch. Anyway, after slotting the graphics card into the PCI Express slot, we can secure it in place with two screws provided, and finally hook it up with some power. And before we forget, this panel needs replacing. I'm struggling to come up with a name for it, it doesn't seem to have much purpose apart from covering up the gap. All that's left to deal with is the side panels, and some thermal testing, and add more fans, then more thermal testing, then some b-roll footage, but if this was a personal build we'd pretty much be finished here. So let's kick that side panel replacement off with the offside panel. So at this point you must know what's coming, there's no way you can cram that many cables into a case this size without there being some sort of readjusting to do. So after a couple of failed attempts, the inevitable rearrangements came into play, but once we were past those, the panel was able to squeeze into position and after replacing the screws to the rear, we could take a look at the damage. Maybe a poor choice of words, perhaps temporary displacement would be more accurate. There is a fair amount of flex in the panel though, and at least for the top section, it's all down to the front IO cables funneling through the upper rear hole in the motherboard tray. Moving on to replacing the windows side panel, let's first take a look at the clearance we have to work with from the peaks of the heat pipes of the Hyper 212 EVO. There's only millimetres left if that. The bulge of the side panel however does cover this, but if the heat pipes were 1cm higher in the case I would have my concerns. Anyway, the window side panel had no pressure against it so it goes on without an issue in sight. The question now is, how about those thermals? Well, right out of the gate, we're looking at a bit of a fail, with the CPU calling timeout due to thermal throttling after the 3 minute mark, and the graphics card fighting on to the 6 minute mark, but again succumbing to the thermal throttling issue, like the CPU. Compared to the rest of the Micro ATX cases tested so far, well, I don't know why I bother showing these if a system fails due to thermal throttling, since there's not really a lot to compare apart from which one failed first. There aren't that many cases that can handle a 91 watt CPU at full tilt with just a Hyper 212 EVO cooling it. So the next question is, can this be improved with more airflow? To find the answer to that question, let's swiftly move on to the maximum airflow test, which if you're new around here means we're cramming the case with as many 2200 RPM fans as possible, and we'll be replacing all stock fans with, again, more 2200 RPM fans to force as much air through the system as we can. Summing up the changes, the front single intake fan has now been paired with the second, the rear stock exhaust fan has now been replaced, and if we could, we would be placing two extra exhaust fans up top. However, due to the SSDs blocking all of the cable routing holes, forcing the front IO cables to cross through one of the fan positions up top, we could only fit one exhaust fan up top towards the rear. But realistically, a top front exhaust fan wouldn't really have a great impact on the CPU or GPU performance, so without further ado, how did it go? Well, hmm, the first attempt looked pretty bad, bad enough for me to question the build. So I removed the CPU cooler to find, well, the thermal paste was fine. So I added a little more before reassembling the case just to make sure, remember having too much doesn't negatively impact performance by the way, and then we ran through the test once more. And the thermals had basically not improved. Well, not by much anyway. The CPU clocked out at 3 minutes again, and the GPU struggled on but tapped out as it just entered the final minute marker. It was a heartbreaker. So what's with all the poor thermal results? Well, first off, we have a pretty high power system being tested. 
The CPU has a TDP of 91 watts and will easily go above 120 watts and more during torture testing, so that's something that not a lot of CPUs will do. Most of the Ryzen, i5 and i7 range were around the 65 watt mark, but there are a few that go up to around the 91 watt mark. And the R9-390X is a legendarily hot card. It's not very efficient in the slightest and especially compared to today's graphics cards. But why did this case perform worse than others? Well, here's my thoughts on the matter. It has to be something to do with the airflow through the system, and the only potential bottleneck I see is the foam filtering to the front and top panels, the front in particular. Although the front panel is fully ventilated, that foam strip doesn't exactly have 1mm holes all over it. It's a pretty dense filter as filters go, and I might have to test this in the very near future to do a video and show my findings on the matter. Let me know in the comments below if that's something you'd like me to work on. Anyway, enough with the chit chat, enjoy the look at the build, and I'll catch you in a couple of minutes to wrap up. So for £30, I think this case is an absolute steal. Uh, for the price, the amount of compatibility you have is, is brilliant. We'll get onto that in a second. The build quality, just, it really, it's not amazing. I'm not going to overblow it and say, well, it's, you know, rivaling some of the really high-end Corsair or, you know, Cooler Master stuff. It is, it is damn good for £30, I'll give you that. There are a couple of panel gaps that you might be able to notice, such as uh, on, the, on the legs, but on, honestly, that's just such a, a small point to make that it's barely worth bringing up. There, there are little things there, but I mean, apart from that, I haven't come across anything that is ridiculously out of the ordinary um, from, from pretty much any other case. In terms of compatibility for CPUs, 160mm or 159mm Hyper 212 EVO will easily fit in there. Probably go a little bit further, maybe to 165, but I would stay below 160 for guaranteed compatibility with this case. Uh, hard drives, just SSDs, the storage, you can just throw so much in here and it will work. Now, I wouldn't recommend having two SSDs next to each other, top and bottom. It does work, you have to do a little bit of configuring of your cables to make it work properly, but I mean, it will just about work, but I mean, sticking five hard disk drives or five drives into this case just full stop is just a bit nuts. And considering in some other boards you can stick M.2 SSDs in as well, I mean you're looking at a system in here of potentially seven drives uh, in a Micro ATX case for £30. Um, that's pretty nuts. Uh, on the note of cooling, I mean obviously not the most impressive cooling that we've seen, but this is a 91 watt processor and it will go above that during torture testing. If you are running a 65 watt processor, which is the majority of the market uh, for performance or uh, not enthusiastic, enthusiastic, enthusiast CPUs, but for the majority of performance CPUs, then 65 watts will be a ballpark that it'll work fine for that. And if you really are struggling, I mean, rip the mesh out. Uh, it's not really a problem. You can just pull that mesh out and you'll just have this sort of vent doing uh, a slight amount of filtering, but nothing too extensive. But you can just 
blow the system out or, or um, dust it out every now and then, you'll be fine. Anyway, before going on too long on that subject, thermals, don't worry about it, you'll be fine. If you're playing games, don't worry about it, you'll be fine. Doing video editing and stuff like that, eh, maybe you want something a little bit better, or just rip that filter out. I'm babbling. In terms of, well, going on to cable management from there, I think makes sense. I'm That's my biggest sticking point with this case, but... Bear in mind, the amount of stuff we've put into here is pretty ridiculous. If you're going for, say, uh, two uh, two and a half inch drives and a three and a half inch drive, and the rest of the system as I've done it here, just don't worry about it. You you will be fine with this case. I would have liked to have seen, I've, I've said in a previous take, the bulge to be a bit bigger, but, you know, is that not everyone's problem? No, I, I would like to see that that... Uh, pop out was a little bit wider and so you can you can have more accessibility around the outskirts but my other like dream for this case would be if it was like five millimeters wider that's not going to change the overall design that much uh, but it's going to give you that extra five millimeters in the motherboard tray and that means a whole hell of a lot when it comes to cable management so i'd love to see that in a future revision of this product i think this has got legs uh on it i'm not sure how old this product is actually uh, it could be like four years old now and they probably don't even you know i'm not even thinking about doing it but that would be one one huge point I would say for this case to bring it that much uh, higher in terms of my opinion of it. Uh, in terms of its style, that's completely subjective. Uh, it's not very gamery or anything like that, but you throw some LED lighting strips in, or if you want to go super budget, get a one meter lighting strip, coil it around the front. Uh, if you could go for something with magnets, I find they're so much easier, but for me, I do lots of case reviews, so going from one case to the other, having a, a, an adhesive foam strip would not work, so magnets work for me. But if this, this is going to be your main build, an adhesive foam strip, the foam ones are better generally than the uh, the tape ones, uh, would, would just stick right around. That might cost you £10 for a budget one, and you know, you're going to be absolutely fine. It's going to look fantastic. Um, so I, I don't know what else there is to say about it. Uh, I think for £30, if you like the looks of it and you were just wondering, is the build quality quite there or, or what's the compatibility like? Hopefully this video has answered all those questions. Um, and I would 100% recommend that you just throw your money down on it. It is really is fantastic. Um, but one thing I would say in terms of acoustics, which I didn't really pick up on, is that uh, in terms of acoustics, the, the system is fine. My sticking point was my power supply unit. So if you want a really quiet build, this case might might be a, a decent a starting point for you. Um, but you really have to remind yourself on that power supply unit, uh, especially if you're doing fan side down, because you're having all the noise of the, the power supply unit then uh, is just being radiated through the bottom and through the back of the case. So bear, bear yourself in mind for that point. Uh, look around and see if you can find a power supply unit that has that if it gets up to 50%, then it'll kick the fans in, something like that. Or has a hybrid mode where it will just slow down the fan uh, for a very low amount until you hit a certain wattage. Uh, and then you can tailor that wattage to your system. But yeah, I have, I've gone on way too long already. I... Thank you. I, 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 thank you so much for checking out this video. I really appreciate you checking out the video. If you do like it, or if you did like it and you found it useful, please give that video a like. And if you fancy subscribing, that'll be fantastic. Uh, if you've watched a few videos and you think, well, I like the quality and I'd like to support this guy doing more videos uh, of things like this and as we delve into different component types and things like that, uh, if you want to say, right, I want to put a bit of money down to that, then you could always join the Patreon page and pledge a dollar a month uh, or more if you, if you feel you'd like to. A uh, dollar a month would be a great starting point and if you fancy adding more later that would be fantastic but if you would like to do that that is completely your choice but this these videos are of course free and just watching adverts uh, when the advertisement comes back uh, more reason to subscribe if you want to help us well actually you know we've already got to that mark we're just waiting for YouTube to hurry up on that one um, but anyway thanks for watching the video I'll catch you in the next one suggestions in the comments below and questions of course in the comments below and I'll do my best to help you out catch you in the next one bye bye